it's Monday, October 4th, uh, 3 o'clock, or I'd say technically 3.07 p.m. Clerk, would you please take the roll? As a reminder to all in attendance, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the county YouTube page. Calling the roll, Mr. Schron. Mr. Schron's absent at the moment. Ms. Baker? Here. Mr. Tuma? Here. Ms. Simon? Here. Ms. Stevens? Ms. Stevens is absent at the moment. We have a quorum. Also like the record to reflect that Councilman Miller is also in attendance. Thank you for attending. Uh, any public comments today? No, Madam Chair, no one submitted any public comment. All right, if everyone has had a chance to review the minutes, I would ask uh, that we approve the minutes. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Second. Thank you. Uh, may I have a uh, support to accept the minutes? Say aye. 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 Hearing no nay, no nays, the minutes are approved. All right, we have two uh, matters that were referred to committee, and I would ask um, our 2021-222 be read into the record. Resolution number 2021-0222, authorizing an economic development fund redevelopment and modernization loan in the amount not to exceed $1 million to Manufacturing Advocacy and Growth Network for the redevelopment of a vacant building located at 1800 East 63rd Street, City of Cleveland, for the relocation of Magnet Manufacturing Technology and Job Center headquarters. Thank you. And who do we have presenting today? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vaughn Johnson. I am the Deputy Director of Economic Development for Cuyahoga County. This is my fourth, the start of my fourth week on the job. Okay. So I thought if I may take this opportunity to introduce myself to the committee and then when I'm done I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Anthony Stellan he's going to present to you. So I have um, I've been with the county like I said for three weeks this is three weeks in a day. Prior to that I spent over 25 years in banking economic development and entrepreneurship. I was uh, a senior executive for a bankers bank in Chicago Illinois for uh, over 10 years where I worked with community banks and credit unions. They were actually our clients. After that, I became a chief executive officer of a credit union and then two other credit unions after that, being a chief executive uh, three different times. And that's when I really started to work with um, small businesses, development corporations, and community development corporations as well, providing lending products and services to those institutions and organizations. After that, I moved on to uh, economic development where I worked at Buckeye Shaker Square Development Corporation. I was the deputy director there, as well as the chief operating officer, working in community development, economic development, and also um, uh, in the creation of a, uh, a CDFI, which we were attempting to put together. After that, I became the director of um, the Minority Business Assistance Center, which is an agency of the state of Ohio at the Urban League of Greater Cleveland. And there I worked with small businesses, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, veteran businesses and the like to assist them with procurement opportunities, um, uh, lending opportunities, technical assistance and certifications as well. And that led me to this opportunity. I look forward to being here and using all those experiences and assisting in uh, uh, making uh, Cuyahoga County a destination place for businesses and residents and also uh, retaining the folks that are that are already here. So if there's a, I'd like to open it up if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, thank you and welcome to thank you so much. Uh, Cuyahoga County and, and we look forward to working with you on this and not only this, but other plans that come before us. Do we have any questions? No. So thank you for your presentation. We'll get to know you, I'm sure, even more as we progress through the year and we're glad to have you. Thank you, Councilwoman Baker and the rest of the committee. I'm going to turn it over to Anthony Stella. Anthony? Good afternoon. I'm Anthony Stella with the Department of Development. I'm going to be uh, speaking about, uh, first, we're going to be talking about the deal with Magnet. And um, if we can get the, uh, the, 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 uh, the PowerPoint up <laughs> for, for Magnet. And that's the Manufacturing Advocacy and Growth Network. 
Um, they have applied for a redevelopment and modernization loan for uh, a site in, uh, in Midtown. Um, they're uh, going to be occupying the former uh, Margaret Ireland School. Okay, there we go. Um, which is uh, right, you know, right there in Midtown, uh, just north of uh, just north of Chester Avenue, very close to some of uh, some of the other investments that uh, this department has made in the area, right uh, right across the street from the Dave Supermarket. Uh, fairly close to where Cleveland Foundation will be putting their headquarters. So this will be a much more uh, visible site for them. Uh, they, will, they will be there anchoring uh, the Midtown Innovation District. Um, Magnet is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. They provide consulting services to small and medium-sized manufacturers. They help them grow, help them with new technologies. Uh, they are part of the National Institute of Standards and Technology and also the Ohio uh, Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Um, their current headquarters is on East 25th Street near the uh, Cleveland State uh, campus. The new location not only will provide more visibility, but it's a better layout. It's, it's better set up for, uh, for, what they, for what they'll be doing. This, this is a $15.9 million project of which the county will be providing $1 million from the um, redevelopment and modernization program. Um, the, the terms are listed there. We would do one year at interest only during their, uh, while they're uh, building it out, doing the construction. That would be followed by 15 years, fully amortizing at 2.5%. Um, if the conditions of the loan are met, uh, completing the project and um, meeting the job creation targets, then up to 25% of that million dollars can be forgiven. That's uh, a general term we have for this specific program. So this, um, this, the benefits will be uh, 29 new full-time jobs in Cuyahoga County. Um, it will, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they'll be anchoring the uh, innovation district will be helping to incubate new businesses and to help new businesses grow. This also will redevelop a vacant school building in the neighborhood, provide them a presence there. Um, you can see here, this is a rendering of uh, what the completed project will look like. Um, uh, when our guests uh, from Magna come up, uh, when our guest comes up, he'll show you some more videos and a little more detail of uh, you know how what that'll look like and the programming uh, that that will uh, that will uh, happen there. Um, here we see the uh, sources of financing for the deal. As I mentioned earlier, it's um, about 15.9 million uh, total. Um, so there's uh, there, they have some financing from PNC Bank. Um, there's two facilities that are coming through uh, from PNC Bank. So essentially, there's two pots of money that they've been approved for. The first pot is a, a, a bridge loan, which is helping them bridge um, money uh, from their, uh, for their campaign. They're, they're going out getting, uh, getting donors and getting uh, money. So this, this will help uh, bridge that. The city of Cleveland is participating with uh, $1 million, pretty much exactly uh, what we're doing. Um, we're looking at a million dollars on the deal. And um, the state of Ohio has a grant coming in at uh, one and a half million. Um, and uh, the county has also previously approved a $500,000 uh, EPA loan to help with the uh, pre-development, um, getting the site cleaned up and ready and, and removing the, uh, any, any environmental issues that are there. Um, the remaining funds are, are coming from, from private donors and from, uh, from private funds. Uh, during we uh, we had already vetted this deal through the loan committee. Uh, we had uh, shown the uh, the debt coverage on the on the project here. Um, you could see the debt coverage. I, I showed it compared to what their existing um, cash flows are, and uh, they're well above the 1.2 we would normally require. Basically, 1.2 means that their cash flows could cover the uh, all of the uh, the debt. 
one, 1 1.2 times more than what the, what the debt is. And, uh, and then finally, uh, the, we, we will be taking a uh, second position on the real estate that uh, will be a shared position with the city of Cleveland. Uh, since they're equal, uh, equal loans, we'll be at Apari Pursue. Uh, we're gonna be subordinate to the, to the key bank loan. Um, in addition to this security, uh, they've pledged uh, their equipment uh, to us and we're in a, a first position on that equipment. So that's all the equipment that they currently have and uh, equ equipment they will be acquiring there at the site. So that was some um, additional security we had. That is um, that's what I had for this uh, project and I can open it up for questions or if you'd like to hear from, from the developer. Uh, do we have questions? Yes, Council. I have seven. three questions. Okay. One is, and maybe if you need to pass to um, the other um, individual here, that's fine too. Um, first, what's the value of the real estate if we're second um, in line? Yes, I, I can. Uh... So the as complete value is uh, ten million dollars. So we'll be second behind uh, five million dollars from Key Bank, um, and so the total of of all the uh, all the debt altogether, including us and ahead of us, is seven uh, seven point five million. So we're at a total of seventy five percent on the loan to value, and we we generally accept up to ninety. Second question is on the collateral. A, what is the collateral? And B, has the county ever had to um, move forward on secured collateral to collect on a loan? And if so, how do we do that? Do we get an auction? What, how, is, how is that done? Okay, so um, as far as the collateral, obviously it's the, the position on the building. And then secondly, I, um, there's a list of equipment that we have. Um, as far as us ever collecting, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think maybe, maybe Mike would be better suited to know that, how, if we've ever done it or, or how we go about that. Councilman, uh, through the chair, um, there are probably one or two examples uh, where we have had to, uh, once we foreclose or declared default and moved in a foreclosure action that we've been involved with um, the, uh, the idea of securing whatever assets were left out of the, um, out of, out of the project. And I, I'm literally struggling. I know uh, I'll have to get you that. I, I don't off the top of my head know these were, these were loans that uh, reach back to you know, 2012, 2013, where uh, again, these were elongated things where we were also in it with the state of Ohio. So there were complex kind of foreclosures, but I can give you examples of a couple of, there are very few incidents where we've had to uh, go in and actually take uh, property uh, as collateral value for, for our loan. So I, I'm, I'm gonna confess that I do not have at my fingertips but they're so rare that we have not had to do that. Uh, and as, uh, as uh, Anthony says, uh, the, our best uh, secure, uh, security posture is this second position that we have on the real estate right behind the bank. So that would be part and parcel of whatever action may take place if, if uh, Magnet was not making the, the, uh, uh, the debt service. Uh, we'd be in league then with, with Key Bank in terms of a foreclosure action for that, and the real estate is there. Okay, um, I'll, I'll have my other question asked, you know, if, if the chair wants to move on, but this collateralizing really is more of a hassle when it comes to collection and- uh, Well, no, no, not really. The equipment, I mean, uh, the well, equipment, I'm uh, talking about equ the equipment. equipment. You've never done, I mean, what do you do, sell it? I mean, uh, and do. there's a glut of equipment right now. Um, because well, of not all this kind of equipment. Again, you can make the argument, first of all, it's very specialized equipment, and so there's everything from laboratory equipment to machinery to, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, robotic uh, equipment. Uh, uh, much of what's going to be purchased is going to be for this brand-new facility, and it's going to be 
uh, newly bought, uh, and it's going to be, I think, very valuable in the marketplace. Again, it's, it's difficult for us to completely gauge what the value would be, and that's why that's a secondary piece of security as opposed to uh, having a lien on the, on the real estate. And why not any personal guarantees? Well, this is a nonprofit organization. Okay. So uh, there wouldn't be anybody okay. to to get a a personal guarantee from. There's a there's a, it's a nonprofit it has a, a board of volunteer trustees and it has an executive director and staff that would not be okay. Asked no, to put that it. was my bad. I'm, I forgot it. This one was the the 501. Okay, lastly, I'll let the chair move on, but I, I will have a question on the jobs and why the new number of jobs um, by virtue of the move alone. So. And I will definitely get you that list of, I think there are two that I can give uh, empirical examples of, of when we've had to go in and uh, take collateral. Thank you. And I appreciate that question. And just as a quick follow-up to it, um, you have it listed M&E. Is that equipment? Machinery and equipment, Machinery and correct. Equipment, and you have yes. that at 500000 Am I right there? Of, um, uh, yeah, that, that's, what the current, uh, that's what the current equipment is valued at. And that's... That's given. That's given also a disc, uh, a sort of a liquidation value to that. Okay. How much more will be added to that five hundred thousand in new equipment? Um, I'd have to. And take that's a what look. we're. That's the. Sure. So um, there's going to be um, in new equipment and uh, fixtures about one, uh, a little over one point one million. One point one plus the five hundred. That's so yes. maybe one point six million is what we have as collateral. Is that yes, outside of the the mortgage, obviously, which mortgage, is which right. is much stronger than this is just a, some additional collateral. But PNC, did I hear, has the first on the on the property? Yes, PNC will have the first on the property. Okay, thank you. Any other questions as we move on? I did have a question then on the and it sounds like Councilwoman Councilwoman uh, Simon was going there, but the. Um, amount of newly created jobs is listed as being 29, I believe I read. Yes. And then it said um, existing jobs that will be retained is zero. So can you explain um, where are those that are working for us, are working for Magnet now, where are they going, and how does that enter into the 29 that's listed? Um, I'll have to... Apologize. Did, is is it? It's under was, the economic development loan. It's it was in the backup of our council. Because I don't I don't think that's I don't think that's accurate. And I uh, trying to figure out they chair. will they will be retaining the, the three is uh, pr the project will create twenty nine jobs. I have number of jobs created twenty nine. Number of jobs retained zero. Now that could be maybe it's not correct. Yeah, that that's if that's in there, that's that's an error. They're, they will be retaining their current staff, and then they will be adding new positions with their move and expansion. Yeah, I'm sure. I may economic development. Uh, th that's simply a typo. Number one. Uh, oh, really? They're, they're, okay. Uh, uh, and I, I will say, uh, and I think uh, many of you used to this. We zero our formulaic sort of uh, working on lending has to do. So that's the formula we use, uh, formulas that are something like 35000 up to $50,000. Excuse me, Mr. May, can you speak into the microphone, please? Sure. Of capital provided for a project per job created, new uh, full-time jobs. So that's what we key in on, and so that is probably, I mean, that's certainly the, the 29 jobs is absolutely, it's within three years, and that's the formula that we base our loan on. The idea of retention, Again, I, I wish the zero wasn't there because there, uh, there, of course, is going to be full retention of the jobs that Magnet has as its at its current facility. They simply will be sliding them over to the new facility. So we will get you that number with regard to retention, or, or Mr. Carp can, can tell you uh, right out uh, what, how many jobs are there right now. Uh, I would imagine all of which will be uh, shifted over to the new facility when it's up and running. Good, because we don't want to count the created or the existing jobs into the 29 created. They may have different positions, but it's still the same number of people. Yes, correct. And it also is connected to the uh, forgiveness 
of 25 percent. Yes, that's so correct. So we certainly don't want to see any of that 29 be part of what's already right. there. Right. When, uh, when we get to the point where we draft the agreement, we, we, get, that, uh, we get the number uh, from the borrower, and that number is basically the base, which becomes zero, and then everything above that number is, is what we count as far as new jobs. So what is the, Madam Chair, what is the existing rate? We don't know. I, I think we're going to be hearing as the presentation continues. Yes, and I, I, I do apologize for that. I th thought it was in here, but it is not. But the zero is definitely incorrect. Okay. Yes. Uh, Vaughn Johnson, Economic De Development. I believe the number you're looking for is 40. 40. 40. Employ employees. Thank you. All right. Um, Good to know. So 40 existing, 29 new. Correct. And uh, where is Magnet is closing its current facility and moving to this new headquarters? Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, they're, they're leaving that facility to, to move uh, to this one, yes. Okay. And do we know what's going to take the place of where they're vacating? Um, I don't know specifically, but I believe they're currently... Um, when, uh, when I was first talking on this day, I believe they're, they're leasing that space and they're going to purchase this space. So the owner of that building will lease it to, to some new tenants. What is the square footage of where they're going? Do we um, know? Yes. Is that a question I should wait and ask later? No, I believe I do have that one. I... Is it considerably larger than where they're where Yes, they it is. It is. It's... Um, the layout is much better. I think where they are currently is a lot of office space and very little uh, manufacturing space. So this will sort of flip that around. There'll be more space for, for manufacturing and for uh, demonstrations. Okay. Any other questions on the details of the loan? Okay. Well, thank you. Look thank forward you. to and hearing if, about, about the project. Sure. And if uh, I would like to call up uh, Ethan Karp from Magnet to... Uh, talk further about the deal. Great, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Hello. Hello. Thank you guys for having me here. Thank you for considering this. Yes. I'm going to show a video here which gives you a kind of raw, raw picture of this. And then I have a little um, walkthrough that I can narrate. And it starts to get at all the pieces and parts of the building. And then you guys can pepper me with what any questions you have whatsoever. So if we could play that first video with sound, that would be awesome. Three people, three very different stories. One common thread. Manufacturing has changed my life. Manufacturing has changed my life for the better. Cause I, you know, I go to bed with a purpose and I wake up with a passion. Manufacturing has changed my life. It has opened so many doors for me and it's given me a pretty big future ahead of myself. Manufacturing changes lives and Magnet makes that happen. We help manufacturers grow. We create new jobs and train people to fill them. We bring our industry and community together to solve the biggest problems that hold us back, poverty and equity and the skills gap. Organizations like Magnet, um, which could pull together various resources, various connections in the, uh, the hope of creating a larger goal and the hope of um, accomplishing something larger than any one company can do themselves. Uh, is, is really pretty special. The coordinated effort was invaluable because you have organizations like Towards Employment, Urban League, uh, Magnet, and the foundations all working together, but oftentimes uh, they, you, you get multiple touch points. Um, and an effort that coordinates that for you is always invaluable because if you're a manufacturer, efficiency is the name of the game. We focus on manufacturing because it's the engine that drives Northeast Ohio. But the future is coming fast and we can't afford to be left behind. Now's the time to reinvent our industry, to transform the way we work, to really innovate. We can change our region's future if we do four things. Train the talent we need, transform with technology, win with innovation, and come together in powerful partnerships. If we do all of this, Northeast Ohio can lead the world in smart manufacturing, digital, 
automated, connected. We have a blueprint to make this happen. We have a powerful team of companies and community leaders. But what we don't have is a place for this bold vision to come to life. That's where Magnet's manufacturing, innovation, technology, and job center comes in. It's more than a building. It's a beacon of change, hope, and opportunity. A place where people get training and jobs, where innovation incubates, where manufacturers learn to build smart factories, where students get excited about manufacturing careers, where thousands of people like Deanna, Eddie, and Isabrin can find a new future while we build a new future for manufacturing. I definitely believe that Northeast Ohio can be a leader. Together, we can make this happen. And it will make things better for Northeast Ohio and everyone who lives here. Thank you for that. You can queue up the other one and I can, I can jog through it here. So that is uh, two pieces in one. So one is a vision we have for manufacturing that has been created through our board, hundreds of other manufacturers, two years of work to say, you guys can check it out at makeitbetterohio.org to say this is what the future of manufacturing is going to need. And it's those four broad buckets. What well, turns out uh, our lease, the leaseholder is CSU, so our lease is expiring. And so we said, well, if this is our vision for manufacturing, how could a future building support that? And what you're going to see is each piece of the building is meant to support that vision, which is why we've been successful so far in getting community support, getting our manufacturers to step up, to be something very visible, to share in that pride of manufacturing. But also you're gonna see there's a huge workforce component to this that we can't do in our current building. In fact, those three individuals that you saw on there are all products in some way, shape or form of workforce programs, some of which you guys already support through the sector partnership effort. So one uh, spent 13 years in, in, in a prison and came back in, one was a bus driver for 18 years and makes double what uh, she was making then. And one is a high school student who went through CMSD and now is at Lincoln through a, a high school apprenticeship program. All of those programs and more are what we're going to be able to centralize in this new building. So if we could show that other video, I'm just going to, perfect, thank you. So I'm going to walk through, you guys know where this is, so I can skip that piece. Um, as Anthony mentioned, right, this is the Market Ireland site. So to get site control, we had to purchase this from the school district. So it required unanimous uh, CMSD board vote to do this. They were excited to do it and they did a sale lease back in fact. So there is a portion of the building that is leased to CMSD because of our partnership to help their students see careers in manufacturing as somewhere where they can both grow, they can earn a good living, get college debt free, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the Dave's in that area that I know you guys have put a ton of uh, money into. Here's the Cleveland Foundation. I worked the mouse a little bit. Here's the Cleveland Foundation headquarters. And so it truly is anchoring, as Anthony said, other future buildings on sites that might provide um, uh, more innovation between our academic institutions and all the things being planned in the innovation district. So if we go ahead and say, well, what's actually inside the building? As we cut this away, you can see that this 53,000 square foot building, which is actually slightly smaller than our current building, unfortunately, as Anthony said, our current building is mostly office space. So that's not exactly helpful for what we're trying to do. The new building is much more tilted toward uh, meeting space and manufacturing space. So each of these colors represents one of those blueprint pillars, one of those strategic pillars. So first of all, going from easiest to hardest, so the innovation pillar. We say manufacturers need to innovate on their products, on their services. Well, we have an entire area because this is at our core. What we've done for 35 years is we will help design equipment, help design uh, products, help companies think about implementation of new technology. That's small and medium-sized companies. That's our role in life is to help them grow and add jobs to the economy because they don't get access to high quality services, even though 98% of our, small manu our manufacturers are small and they need that support and that help. That's the market gap that we as a nonprofit fix. So in that section of green, we will have all of the equipment 
which we have a small bit of now, to be able to do all that work and have our full-time engineers work on projects in this area and also even have startups have a section so that when they have small-scale production, for example, Cleveland Whiskey is in our current building. We've designed all their equipment. Okay, how do they, how does a company like that have some small-scale production before they go out and move? The purple area or that's magenta area, this is about transformation. The future of manufacturing has everything to do with digital transformation. There's a ton of technologies, collaborative robots, uh, big data. You hear these buzzwords. Well, they're affordable for small companies now, but they don't know about them and they need a way to touch and feel them. That's what will go on here. The blue areas, and there's more upstairs, there's a second floor for offices, are highly centralized meeting spaces, this one, in fact, for a few hundred people, where we can bring in multiple parties. So during uh, the, the last year, we were at the center of all of the PPE that was being created. Um, and we are helping companies see new supply chains, retool to make literally tens of millions of pieces of PPE. That sort of collaboration is deep in our DNA, and we want to do that more, but that requires actually bringing people together. So this space will have the appropriate amount of collaboration area so that companies, organizations, other nonprofits can meet here. And every single time they bring somebody into the building, they're also raising the awareness of manufacturing because the whole building is going to scream manufacturing to them. And then really the centerpiece of the building is what's in orange here. And specifically, it's what we're doing with what's in orange here. So talent. So there, these are the CMSD classrooms. And inside those CMSD classrooms, we're not fully sure what it all will entail, but a big piece of it's going to be taking what we're currently doing through the sector partnership and helping adults transition into the workforce to say the same thing, say for a second semester senior experience, couple weeks, get a certification, have an employable skill before a student graduates. But we're also going to be taking tours. And let's say it's one of the younger grades in CMSD and inner ring suburbs and anybody that wants to take a tour and it's maybe ninth graders and seniors will have different tour experiences so that literally thousands of students can come through and get a live plant tour. We know that the stigma of manufacturing keeps a lot of people from going into manufacturing. It's dark, dirty, dangerous. And the only and best way we have to dispel that is what happened, for example, today, Science Center right now with our help and, and their awesome folks there hosting, I think, 500 students and six of our largest companies at the Science Center doing this live tour. Turns out Science Center is actually designing this whole experience with us. So throughout the entire year, we can have student tour groups coming in. It'll even be backtracked to their curriculum in their classroom. They will learn about a scientific thing and then come to us, get a hands-on experience doing something with all the new technology, with all the equipment in here. That is absolutely the centerpiece of this building and something we totally cannot do in our current facility. So now we have pretty pictures that you guys can see now that you see all the full functionality of it. Um, you'll see highly visible from Chester. This is your view going that direction on Chester. Uh, you'll be able to see into the manufacturing floor. This is around the back in the entrance. Everything focused on this manufacturing space back here. Here's the large event space. Back there is where the CMSD wing opens up. Office space, a work cafe. We're going to be showing, for example, the central kitchen uh, incubator for their, their foods that'll be on display in, in our little kitchen area. Um, more conference rooms. This is the show space for uh, equipment, that smart manufacturing tech that I was mentioning, followed by the prototyping and innovation area, followed by the startup space. Now, the building we've called a job center for a very specific reason. I need to describe that after I show that there will be a playground meant just for the community that is STEM themed. Again, one of the pieces we're working on with CMSD, or excuse me, with CMSD and with the uh, Great Lakes Science Center. That STEM playground is going to be unique, and we've worked a ton with the local Hoff community to figure out, well, what do they want, what do they need in a playground, and then we're adding to it themes that would excite people. Imagine a mural of you know, heroes of African-American manufacturing and engineering being on the wall overlooking this park. The park is truly for the community's benefit. This uh, is an example of the CMSD classrooms. It's a classroom. There's even a fab lab maker space to connect the classroom learning to what's going on in the rest of the building. That's this space. So it is a job center. If anybody walks in off the street, we are not going to just say, oh, here, have a tour, nice day. There will make sure that from the workforce ecosystem, there will be a person in there to take them down their own coaching job journey, even if it's not manufacturing. That is the job center portion of this. There will be a job concierge on site, in addition to people that can take them around and show them as the public, what manufacturing has to offer. 
that is our vision for this building. And, and I think it can make a really big difference to Cleveland. Certainly nothing like it exists around here uh, to celebrate manufacturing in this way. And so again, we very much appreciate you and the team's help to get it to this point. Wow. It's very, uh, very exciting to see that overview. Before we get started, anyone have any questions on this project? Did, uh, the square footage was the less. The square footage is 53,000. Sorry if I'm off by a couple thousand, but 51, 53,000 square feet. Is less than where you're moving from. Correct. That is odd. That, uh, and is that was, is where you're moving from all in one floor? No. It's on four floors. Okay. So that, is this on one or two floors? This is on two floors. Most of it's on one floor. The current space only has about mm, 6,000 square feet that is applicable with the floor supports for manufacturing space. So the other ones become offices, uh, not to mention that the ability to see it from the street and be visible is not what we'd like. Okay. Madam Chair, I've been yes. to their space. It's not productive. Excuse me, Ms. Stevens. Can you speak into the microphone? I'm sorry. I've been to their space. It's not productive for having um, more than three or four people work on an individual machine. It doesn't allow them to recalibrate their floor uh, so that if there is something they really want to teach 50 people, they can't do it because it's split up between the multiple floors. So I think this is a great move for them. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, a couple questions I have for you. Please. So uh, 29 new people. I guess I would ask... First of all, the vision of what you have now with 40 people in place doing what you have to do in order to elevate those that are interested in manufacturing or jobs as a whole, what is going to be different? Mm -hmm. So you're moving from one place to another, more efficient, more space, um, but you're also hiring 29 additional people. So what will be different than what you're doing now? Are those 29 going to go out into the community? Are they going to search? Are they going to go into the schools? Are, is, is the vision a little different? How, can you explain? Yeah, so, so it's out? actually all of the above. So they're not concentrated in one place. So um, we, we are definitely increasing our staff to be able to staff up the innovation facilities, not just to tour people around, but to actually do more work with companies. So some of it is there. Some of it is that classroom teaching um, to actually take students through. Some of it's the tour guiding and the job concierge and that concept. And then some of it is also to help do the global workforce that we know needs to happen, which we do know needs to be more in the community. So yes, some of it will be that as well. Actually, you kind of enumerated all of the various areas that we would be expanding into. And, and I wouldn't say expanding into, but expanding our current capabilities. Although, of course, we do not have um, robust teaching facilities currently. Right. Okay. That's. And so uh, how are you going to be supporting this expansion? How do the students pay? Are the classes, what, how does that revenue piece work? For I know it's not profit, but you still need to support sure. those teachers that are coming in to teach and Yes. So a, a lot of the teacher pieces will be in collaboration with CMSD, who's obviously committed on that front. The um, pieces around the workforce um, are some supported by the company, some supported by grant infrastructure that we secure. The core of all of the technical services to manufacturers, that is both fee-for-service work, that all of our project work is fee-for-service work with clients, and then also the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, that is our backbone sort of government funder. It's a federal line item we created 35 years ago, 37 years ago. It now is in all states and it filters through the state that matches it and call that half of our budget. So wow. that also will support a piece of this expansion and those numbers are growing. It's in the federal budget right now to hopefully to 3X those numbers in the future, but we're not reliant upon that. All of our models are based off of steady, modest increases, largely coming from our business sector. Okay, that's what I needed to hear. Right. Yes. Go right ahead. Uh, Mr. Miller. First of all, thank you very much for, for coming in and presenting this exciting project to expand manufacturing in, in Greater Cleveland. And uh, my question is whether you're planning to have more people working from home so as to reduce the need for office space so that you can focus on other activities. 
Uh, short answer is yes. Um, in fact, all of our office space except the engineers are uh, hotel wing stations. So, and we have a number of folks that I think might co-locate with us, which is kind of exciting, other small technology focused nonprofits. And in that scenario, they would be using the hoteling as well because they're all not fully present. So we see there's huge, uh, even today, the remoteness is, it gets to us, right? So we definitely like to have our folks come in, not right now with the COVID as it is, but uh, when it was less severe. We'd love to have people come in on a regular basis so that we can have that connectivity. But uh, most of our folks are on the road anyway, because a lot of our work is done inside the companies, except the engineering and now the tour guiding. So, yes. So when you talk about hoteling space, what do you mean by that? I mean, space that is not assigned to a, a particular human being. And so all of our furniture is reconfigurable. So you could take a table and you could say, all right, let's, let's do four people here. Let's do six people here. There are cubbies so that people can roll their furniture in and say, all right, well, you can have your little cubby thing, your little drawers, but you're going to, you know, that's where your personal effects go if you're coming in all the time. But unless you're finance department or you're the engineering department, it's uh, first come, first serve tables. It's... Uh kind of like back to the future that that's how it was at uh, at Cleveland City Hall in the in the early 80s it's interesting any other questions uh, yes. madam chair just one yes go right yeah ahead. um so um your 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 guys's vision is is very interesting it looks like it's going to do a lot of good let me just ask from the financial point of view what um do you need the the county for? I mean, because you had PNC involved and City of Cleveland's involved. Um, just why the partnership with Cuyahoga County? Why are you seeking that? Sure. So, I mean, it's a large project, and um, you know we can't scramble all the pieces together. Uh, we're already putting basically all the cash that we have that we don't need to run the business into this. We're doing our darndest to fundraise as much as we can, but we know that there's still going to be a gap. And um, frankly, the, the financing from the uh, financial institutions is, will only go so far. Um, and so that's why we're looking to you all and why we appreciate it. Okay. I, no, I appreciate it. I think it's a, a, a fair question <laughs> to ask. So um, who, who's going to determine uh, how much of the forgiveness on that debt? Is, is that the county that does that? Yeah. If you could maybe just address that. Yeah, this is uh, completely in the purview of the county and uh, uh, wasn't explained fully to you. So this is uh, the Redevelopment and Modernization Loan Program, which expressly works on lending to projects uh, that are dealing with existing structures that have been vacant or environmentally contaminated, uh, have uh, all of those problems and have been blighted and abandoned. So this property has been uh, vacant for a very, very long time, does have asbestos issues. So we, we uh, it really is a good fit for this program. Uh, now, part and parcel of that program is an up to 25% forgiveness of the loan principal mm -hmm. if the project is completed, i.e. it is cleaned up and it is actually effectuated so that the project is actually full out uh, done. And then the jobs are created as well. So there's a three year period between the end of the project completion, if you will, and then uh, uh, the time period upon which they have to, uh, they'll certify to us, number one, that the project is completed. Uh, we have format for that. And then uh, in the ensuing three years, they have to have created those jobs. And that's where our uh, our ruling on whether that forgiveness will take place. Okay, so, I appreciate that explanation. Yes, thank you. Great. May I uh, just follow up on that? So the twenty five percent of one million would be two hundred fifty thousand. Correct. If they reach say twenty five instead of twenty nine or twenty, is that prorated? Uh, it is prorated, yes. And we've done that recently with Gojo Industries with the GJ Real Estate Program. What we've discovered is that that's really the best approach to have uh, uh, in that they would have succeeded, number one, again, in the project rehabilitating and, and uh, activating a, a vacant building. That That's a long way toward what we really want to achieve. And then the job thing, we have basically established a formula within our um, loan agreement, uh, and we've used this several times now, we're basically to the degree 
I guess I'll put it in, in negative terms, to the degree that they fail on the full 29 jobs, uh, they would get docked a percentage basis, uh, but, you know, commensurate with the, with the uh, not having achieved all those 29 jobs. So say 20 jobs of 29, I'm not sure what the arithmetic on that is, but they basically would be docked nine over uh, 29, whatever that percentage is, of the 250. Would there be a period of time that two or three years later they accomplish their 29th? They've got maybe eight more, but is that no? Their considered? shot is they, they the three years is the time That's period, it. and whatever we uh, has been uh, implemented and, and succeeded upon, that's that's where we would. Uh, make the final ruling and sort of provide that uh, forgiveness, and then the rest would be um, uh, just a moot point. <laughs> okay, good. All right. All right, good to know. It's a good question. Yes. Just um, quickly, thanks, saying. Madam Chair. Uh, thanks so much for bringing this to our attention. It's a great move, it looks to be. What What is holding us back and really filling jobs and manufacturing here? And are there other models like this? You said we're the only ones like this here. Um, do you look to other places that perhaps are really excelling? Not that you're not, but we still have a lag between the demand and the supply. I'll get on my I'll get on my soapbox for a moment. Um, so, so the the problems with manufacturing uh, employment, by the way, everybody's feeling it now. But manufacturing been looking at this for 20, 25 years, largely unsuccessfully here or anywhere. This is, a, this is a problem that nobody has fixed. And in fact, we here in Cuyahoga County, through the sector partnership work, are often being held up across the state and increasingly across the nation is actually figuring some things out. So in the last 18 months, despite 80% eight, you know, of the people that come into the workforce system, I have the uh, honor and pleasure of also being the board chair of the Workforce Development Board. So 80% uh, roughly in our system has been the drop in the number of people that have come through the system that have been actively seeking work. This is not surprising given what we've seen and the great resignation and all those sorts of things. We've still placed 500 people across these programs in manufacturing, which is a huge number toward the couple thousand that is the gap right now in Cuyahoga County in manufacturing. So when we get at the problems and the root cause, I think that it is we have the, the reason we haven't succeeded and the root cause are the same, that it is a systemic problem that is broken in many, many different places. And often what we try to do, magnet included, is solve one particular problem. If this training is great, then good, we're solved. But not if the transportation doesn't get them there, not if the soft skills aren't getting them there, not if they have a record and the business won't hire them, right? So you've got to solve every piece of this, which means wraparound support, which means transportation, which means training, which means willingness of manufacturers. And it means even once they're on board that we're doing things to support the employees and the manufacturers that if there's a cultural issue, they're actually keeping them and retaining them as well. So all of those things have to be figured out in one solid pipeline, because if you do 90% of it, it's useless to everybody. The person doesn't get a job. They don't, they don't, the, the company doesn't get an employee. So that is my basic, what is broken about the system. And it's not here specific. It's everywhere that this, this is going on. So the solutions have been get manufacturers to step up, say, this is what we'll do. It's actually their money, but also their blood, sweat and tears going into designing these programs, leveraging all the other dollars going into our, you know, 60 odd workforce organizations and saying, well, if you're an organization that's good at wraparound support and you're an organization that knows how to find and support people that are coming out of the criminal justice system and you're the city of Euclid and you happen to know this and this youth program where there are access to 18 to 24 year olds who are, you know, 50% unemployed in your area. Great. Okay. We're going to bring the infrastructure and the manufacturers to you and then we'll run you know short training programs or we will create a program for this specific company that directly targets you increasing you know that whole connectivity and where i tell you where we are now is we have that connectivity in a lot of different ways the biggest problem that we face now to uh, Chair Baker's uh, question around people in the communities is recruitment in the communities. There, there's a lacking, there's a disconnect, right? That 80% drop in people, well, we can't go out this in, and, and find more people and get them interested in that very human to human way, which is I think ultimately what has to happen here. We can put as many billboards, because we've tried, as we want out there. We do not change the perception of manufacturing. This facility will do that in a very hands-on way, and we will have people there, the job concierge concept, 
so that when they raise their hands, they will have a human being to welcome them and to hopefully get them through that process into manufacturing and layer on all of those other pieces that we need. So that is my very long answer to the root cause of this problem, but I'm, I'm, I, I think that there are enough people trying this in various different ways to say that it is breakdowns at multiple levels that we have the power to fix. And like I said, sector partnership is actually doing it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So box done. Okay, that was that was good. And you know, it's it's ironic because there was a time back in maybe the '60s and '70s where working in in manufacturing was where our high school kids went. They yes. came out of high school, they went right into a manufacturing job, stayed there 30 years, never thought about leaving, and retired, and uh, were able to raise their family and. Um, stay. So we have hopefully come full circle. We're trying to come full circle. Trying to. The, the, let, I'll be honest, the wages need to go up too. There are some companies who have higher wages. Those need to, and they're going up rapidly because that's what happens right now when you can't find people, which is great. Um, but that needs to happen concurrently to all of this. And manufacturers, a lot of them are, you know, places you'd eat off the floor. They're super clean. They're super technology driven. And when you have such a shortage, I can just focus on those companies and say, great. The beautiful part about this is if we actually figure this out as a collective, you know, as a county or a city, um, we can now hold that out and say, well, if you're a manufacturer that looks like this and acts like this and pays like this, you're not competitive to these pipelines that can actually get you people. So we can actually raise the bar. Lots of folks come to me and say, well, what are manufacturers doing their part? Well, the ones we work with are doing a huge amount of their part. They're really putting in. Is it everybody? No, but we can raise the entire of culture of manufacturing to make sure that that vision can be true again right. um, once we have pipelines that actually work. And that those manufacturers who are hiring can make the profits they need to make and still increase the wages to, at the same time. Yes. That, you know, that, that's part of it, too, is that they, yeah. the and, reason and, why they may not be paying enough is it because they're not, they're not producing enough or they're not. And, and that's the full circle, right? That's that vision of the blueprint. That's why each of the pieces of this building are interconnected. The, the technology, without the, without the technology, the company can't make its products productively. Okay but also they can't pay the wages that get good people into their company. So you've got to have all of the pieces, and that's why we want to expose folks to say, this is what the future is in any company you go to. And oh, by the way, companies, this is your future too, and we're here to help on both of those fronts. Wow. So you're on both ends. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our team's 30, 35% focused on workforce, and the rest are this individualized consulting. Yeah. If I may, I think what's good about that is that you have a realistic view of what the owner of the company is enduring in order to keep the doors open. And you are also understanding what it takes to get the employees in the door and stay committed to the, so I, I mean, if you are on one end or the other, you may not have that same perspective. So that, that's that. good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Baker. Um, can you elaborate? I don't know if this is a question for you. Mm -hmm. There's eight point million that is uh, being funded, if I'm reading this correctly, by PNC. So, but half of that is a bridge loan. I'm not sure if it's exactly half, but half of it is just short term. Um, I, I assume that's your question. Yes, Sorry. And, and, yep. and, and I guess I wanted to elaborate on what does the capital campaign look like? Yeah, so it's, it's us raising private foundation and private company dollars. So from folks like, you know, the swage locks of the world and Lincoln's and, and those types of companies. And then from the Cleveland foundations of the world and all the, all our major philanthropies and then our board members who are those companies and more, that's where the capital campaign is coming from. So of that 8.8 .8 million, how much of that is campaign for additional funding? I believe the numbers we have is about half. Is that correct? About half. And you're confident that those that you can campaign for that yes. and acquire that 4.2 mm -hmm. million, I guess is what we're looking at. Four yes. Very confident. Six months in, very confident. Okay, good, good. <laughs> uh, I might have had one more that I arrowed here. Oh, one other, maybe outside of the scope of conversation. Going back to the, um, the dollars that uh, are needed for the renovation and the demolition, that's probably the biggest number you have on your chart of what's needed of the 16 million. So can you say how much of that is demolition and how much of that is renovation? Is it equal? I mean, it's such a big number. I just no. wondered if you knew. David, what, demolition is probably around a million of that, million and a half? Does that sound right? 
So it's a very, it's okay. So most yeah. of it is in your renovation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, there's a million and a half dollar for an HVAC system, for example. It's right. an old school, doesn't have one. Um, so, yeah. And when you talk about the um, equipment and the the, lo the the loan that we have against yeah. that, <clears throat> that also de um, depreciates. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, take you that into, it's different than property. But right. when you take furniture and equipment, and even though it may be expensive equipment, it does right out the door already start to deteriorate and get outdated, especially yes. in this high-tech world we're in. Very true. So that's all been considered when we talk about what our how our money is guaranteed, um, I would I would ask them. I mean, I would <laughs> I would continue to point to the the loan to value piece is the biggest piece there. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Chair Baker, yes, you're correct that uh, equipment pretty much instantly depreciates, which is why that's the sort of the secondary piece of collateral we have, and considering that all of the debt on the building only gets us the seventy five percent we'd be confident in the event of a worst case scenario, we would be pretty much made whole just out of the real estate alone. The, the equipment is just uh, is, is secondary backup. I hear you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for this development plan? Good, well, thank you. Fantastic to hear and I look forward to more good news and manufacturing is where we need to be. It, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm excited to see the project. Yes, Councilman can I, Miller. Can I ask one quick question as to the uh, estimated project completion date? Uh, June, uh, call it this time next year. Our, our goal is September of next year. Um, we have to move some pieces in by next June because of our lease expiration, but uh, it should be around this time next year if all goes as planned. Okay, that's pretty fast. Yes, Thank and you. then three years after that is when you hope to hire those 29, get those 29 people in place. With the existing 40, you're going to be keeping. Yep. Thank you. Chair Baker, thank you guys very much. And also welcome invitation to tour at any point or the hard hat tour. I just stopped down there earlier today. So if you want to see it under construction, just let me know. Great. Thank you both. We appreciate it. All right, well, moving forward then, do I have a motion to approve um, our 2021-0222 to the so full moved. council? I'll second. Second. Tuma, second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Hearing none, your this motion is approved. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Madam oh, Clerk. Madam Chair, Madam I have Chair. a question. Oh. Uh, closing and timing. Uh, are, are they closing quickly or do we have plenty of time to do the standard process? I don't think there's any rush on this. They can go through the three readings, I believe, I was told. If you were in a rush, I'm sure we would hear that <laughs> pretty loud. Three readings, is, three yeah, readings. Three readings standard is fine. readings is fine, yes. Good. Okay, thanks for the question though. All right, um, may we have uh, 2021-0223 read for the record. Yes, and for the record, I'd like the record to reflect that Councilwoman Stevens joined the meeting a little earlier. Resolution number 2021-0223, authorizing an economic development fund redevelopment and modernization loan in the amount not to exceed $1 million to LG Blanket Mill LLC for the redevelopment of a vacant building located at 3160 West 33rd Street, City of Cleveland for a mixed use structure for the Northern Ohio Blanket Mills project. All right, if you would like to give us uh, an overview of this project, sure. we appreciate um, it. Sure. Once again, my name is Anthony Stella. I'm presenting for uh, this project as well. And as if, if you can, uh, there's a PowerPoint that you can get started there. Um, and then uh, I can, uh, that's it. Okay. So uh, this project involves the long vacant uh, Northern Ohio Blanket Mills building located on uh, uh, West 33rd Street in the Clark Fulton neighborhood. Um, the building uh, was originally, uh, as you see the blanket mill, there's a, you know, there's an image there of, uh, of the, the blankets that they used to make there. Um, there's been uh, a few other businesses in that building since that time, but it's generally been vacant for, uh, for, for quite a while now. Uh, here's an overview of the site there. Um, 
it's uh, you know, in a pretty uh, prominent location there um, on the near on the near west side. Um, and this build uh, this business here, LG Blanket Mill LLC, it's a uh, uh, LLC created for this specific project. It's a partnership between uh, Morton Levin Trust, uh, which is 75% owner of the project, and uh, the Metro West uh, Community Development Corporation, who's a 25% uh, pr uh, partner in this project. Uh, the Levin Group is uh, very well experienced in these types of projects, uh, doing uh, low-income housing deals. Uh, they've developed over 1,200 uh, units of housing. And uh, this project here, it's a, uh, it's a mixed use, historic, uh, uh, historic renovation of a building. Um, it's uh, adaptive reuse, so the, the use of the building will be changing. It'll be uh, uh, housing units uh, on, the, on the upper floors. The, the main floor of the building will be a commercial use. Uh, those tenants uh, will be uh, they're looking at uh, a few different tenants that they're uh, that they're engaged with. Um, the social services will uh, generally range from health care and child care directed uh, directed out to that neighborhood. Uh, this project um, will create thirty new full time jobs through those tenants that will be uh, that will be leasing the uh, the ground floor space. Uh, these will be new jobs. Um, and uh, once again, they'll be providing services there in the neighborhood. So not only is this creating jobs, but it's creating jobs that the neighborhood uh, will uh, will benefit from, and uh, and also the residents of the of the uh, the the, the, the uh, building. Uh, this will help return this building to productive use, uh, create activity at a near a prominent intersection. Um, in this project. Uh, uh, achieves uh, achieves these objectives um, uh, that uh, that the Levin Group uh, set forward. Um, this is a uh, rendering of the building as it is. It's L-shaped building. Um, there'll be uh, you know parking on site. Enough for the for the tenants. The top uh, few floors there again will be uh, low income housing. Uh, so this is a very a uh, complicated uh, financial stack, very similar to a deal uh, we brought forward uh, about six, seven months ago, which was the uh, the Warner and Swayze building, uh, very, done in a similar way where the building is um, utilizing both low-income housing tax credits and new markets uh, tax credits. So they have to sort of separate it into two separate, uh, what they do is they create two separate condos because those types of tax credits don't usually work together because low income housing is for uh, residential housing and new markets is for commercial space. So they're, they're utilizing both of those and some uh, both state and federal historic tax credits, which are helping to, uh, to subsidize uh, this project to create, um, to create the, the housing and also to create these jobs to create the, uh, um, the uh, commercial space. It'll be about uh, uh, 1,250 residential uh, units there. So it's going to be providing some some much needed uh, newer uh, low income housing. Um, it's a total of uh, about 64,000 square feet. Uh, 31,000 of that is in the in the commercial space, which will uh, would where our, where the tenants will be locating. Um, so if we take a look, as you can see, uh, as I discussed all of the different um, sources of funding in the deal, the top line there uh, talks about uh, the, the, all, the, all of the tax credit uh, equity coming into the, coming into the deal, um, uh, the member equity, which is uh, the owner of the business, the, uh, there's, a there's a loan there that will be a leveraged loan within the um, new markets structure. Uh, City of Cleveland is, uh, they're providing a total of 3.7 million. 1.7 million is coming from community development uh, through the home program. Then 2 million is coming from economic development. They're essentially putting a TIF into the deal uh, and the TIF payments 
don't begin until year 16 because in the first 15 years, there's no, uh, there's no value because it's, uh, there's a housing project which is already tax abated for those 15 years. And um, so there'll be uh, pilot payments, uh, payments in lieu of taxes, which will, uh, which will service that debt beginning in, uh, it, out in, uh, in year 16. Um, uh, we're, we're coming in with, with $1 million, again, through the redevelopment and modernization program, same program discussed on the other project, which also has uh, up to 25% forgiveness. On this deal will be 30 jobs versus the 29. Um, when we, uh, we ran uh, the pro forma on this uh, project based on uh, projections. Oh. My apologies. It's it's 60 units of housing. I, I was reading 1250. That's how many they've the business that that they've established. So that did seem off to me. So I apologize for that. It is uh, 60 units uh, that will be developed on this site. Um, and uh, we took a look at the pro forma of what the, the projections uh, will look like on this deal. Uh, again, you know, we look at that 1.2 debt coverage as you know, what, what is ideal, and we're just above that at 1.27, uh, take, taking everything into consideration. Um, on this deal, we, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, taking a mortgage on there. Uh, again, we're gonna be in a second position mortgage. Uh, the, the, there'll be one lender ahead of us, who is the OFA lender at uh, 4.48 million. Uh, we have a, we, we do have a, uh, an appraisal that was provided to us, and uh, the appraisal really only took into consideration the residential part of the, uh, of the building. So even when we took a look at that, we were at a 93% uh, loan to value, which is a little higher than we like to be. But when we took a look at the building in its entirety, and we took a look at, um, if you look at the income approach, which is generally how these uh, buildings would be, um, valued, our, our true LTV on this would be around 81% based on that value when, when we look at the entire building. And on this deal, we will get a personal guarantee from uh, Morton Levin um, that was part of uh, what we had negotiated. I don't remember if I went over the terms, which I thought were in, in this, but the, um, the loan terms are very similar to the last one, except we have a two-year construction period. This is a, a larger complex project, so we would have interest-only payments for those two years, and we would follow it with 18 years fully amortizing. Uh, that was a structure we put together to help, uh, to help the project work and also to help ensure that, uh, that um, Metro West would be able to get some, uh, some cash flow out of the deal, being the 25% partner so that they can redeploy those funds into the community for, for projects uh, that, you know, that they would like to see happen. So this is a very interesting deal in where you have the neighborhood nonprofit as a, going to be a partner um, owner in this deal. And uh, I also have a representative from uh, the Levin group here, uh, but I can open it up to questions if you would uh, like to do that first. Anyone have questions on the logistics of the financing program? Yes, Councilman Miller. Good afternoon, thank you for coming in with this project. There's a, a very large gap between the amount of affordable housing that's needed and the amount that we have available, so, uh, so we, uh, we appreciate this effort and uh, my question is, uh, assuming that you're able to achieve the full 25% uh, forgiveness, what would be the total amount of uh, principal and interest that would be paid back over the life of the project? So if, uh, if they receive the full forgiveness, that would be 250000 right off the uh, principle. Um, so in effect, uh, we would be uh, doing two and a half percent interest off of 750,000 over, uh, over 18 years. And I don't think I have an amortization table here with me. Um, I could, 
probably um, make that calculation, but it'll, uh, it would be, you know, 750,000 obviously in, uh, in principal payments over, over the uh, term. Um, if we look at two and a half percent interest over, you know, over a million dollars, you know, you're looking at 20, that would be 25,000 in interest in one year. Obviously it'll be reduced by 25% and then it would be reduced each year by the, by the reduction in principle. Um, you know, not having the amortization table here, I don't know that exact number of what the total payments would be over that stream. Okay. Uh, uh, back of the envelope calculation is 150 to 200,000 in interest over the, would yeah, be my yeah. guess. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, one, I'm not sure if it's for you, or perhaps when we hear more about the project. Um, do we know what affordable housing looks like? What that starts at? What people can expect to pay? That uh, would consider to be affordable? Yes, this th this will be a um, th this will this will be a, a section eight. Uh, so it'll be based on a percentage of of income of percentage the percentage of income. That's how you okay. Yes, and. Um, unlike the last project where it's one focus, this has a few moving parts. You have residential housing, which you don't all, you have turnover, and you have maybe some units leased, some units not. Can't always have 100%. Correct. Same with the retail piece or the commercial piece. Um, that too could be. So uh, uh, the, the, the commercial piece was how much square footage? About... 31,000? 31, 31,435. Uh, did you say we have someone that is, who's going to be occupying that commercial um, piece? They, they are in negotiations currently with uh, three different groups, two health care groups and a child care group. Okay, so... F They're the not ready to, to share who that is yet. But uh, no um, concerns about leasing that space? Feel pretty confident that that will be leased? Yeah, I think they, they feel very confident about that. Okay, because that, that's, a little, that's a little different than one source, one building, one company. Correct. You're depending on, you know, all these parts to work together. Right, and, and yeah, it's, this is, again, similar to the, the deal we looked at with Warner and Swayze. It's also kind of similar to some of the mixed-use deals we do. Obviously, this is much different because it's affordable housing rather than market rate. Right. Um, so yeah, there's you know there's definitely more moving uh, more moving parts, and you know when we look at pro formas, there's always uh, there, there's always uh, a vacancy factor that you look at, especially you know with residential units. Like you said, people are always moving in and out, and right. leases expire at, at different right. times. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'd like to hear, I think, a little more about sure. uh, the project itself. I'll have uh, Kevin Hudson come up from the Live In Group, and he can talk about it further. Welcome, Mr. Hudson. Madam Chairwoman, Council Members, and County Staff, my name is Kevin Hudson, and I am the Director of Real Estate Development for the Levin Group. Uh, we are a, an affordable housing real estate development uh, company. We're property managers. We're real estate owners. Um, as I said, we do mostly, most of our portfolio is in affordable housing that we've developed around 1,250 units around the state of Ohio. Um, but we also have uh, other parts of our company where we do a commercial warehouse, strip retail. Um, we have a subdivisions. We, you know, we do a multi, we're a multidisciplinary company. Um, and so this project sort of brings all the different uh, experience that we have together. Um, and if I can have our presentation brought up so I can walk you a little bit through the project. So as Tony has mentioned, um, the Northern Isle Blanket Mill project, um, the, the building itself is the largest vacant property in the Clark Fulton neighborhood. It's located one block south of the Clark Fulton uh, intersection. Um, it is accessible off of Fulton Road. It's right across the street from Johnny's on Fulton, one block north of St. Rocco's Church. Um, the first floor is 31,400 square feet. Um, the building total is 112, 113,000 square feet in total, um, with the two floor, second and third floor being residential units of, of 60 units total. 
Um, that'll be affordable. That I have we have gotten uh, CMHA Section Eight uh, rent vouchers for the residential units, so it'll be affordable to. There'll be units reserved for thirty and sixty percent of area median income. Um, the Levin Group has been um, has been involved with this project since 2013. Um, when we worked to get the building placed as a city landmark and then re put on the National Register of Historic Places. And it was since and Metro West has been a partner with the project since uh, the, the beginning, they have uh, been supportive of the project. Um, and then through a um, pilot program with Ohio Housing Finance Agency, uh, we were able to actually include them as a, as a full member of the, of the project and be 25% of the general partnership. The building history, it was, the building was the largest manufacturer of woolen blankets. It was built in 1890. There's a couple of different expansions. Um, and by, and it outfitted the um, U.S. Army for World War I. They built, they made woolen uh, horse blankets for horse-drawn carriages as well as passenger robes. But by the 1932, the company had dissolved. Um, and actually the, Property across the street was also a, a woolen manufacturer, so you had quite a textile uh, industry there in the, in the Clark Fulton neighborhood 120 years ago. Um, the building had seen multiple tenants over the years. The last tenant was a tile setter who closed his doors in 2008, but it's been functionally vacant for the 25 to 30 years. Um, numerous uh, tenants who've been involved in the process with us and are local um, residents in, in the Clark Fulton neighborhood and said that they can't ever remember that building being occupied. Um, so it's been quite a depressed sort of eyesore for the, for the neighborhood. As I told you a little bit about the Levin group. Um, our owner is, is, is Morton Judy Levin. Um, we've been, they started the, the company in 1975. The Levin family has been involved in Cleveland real estate now for over a hundred years. Um, Mort's aunt and uncle owned the land that Cleveland State University currently sits on and donated it to the state for the development of the university um, and endowed the Levin College of Urban Affairs. Um, Mort has been very close with, was very close with his aunt and uncle um, and continued the family relationship with the Levin College and has just came off the, the board of trustees two years ago. Um, and myself as a Levin College graduate, we, we use a lot of interns, we talk to the dean, we were involved in a lot of the programming there and we're a very community minded uh, or, organization. In 2019, the Ohio Housing Finance Agency developed a pilot project with Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati, where they gave a, a, an allotment of housing tax credits to each city to designate a target neighborhood with the goal of creating a mixed income neighborhood and gave this each city the control to choose the target neighborhood and then to choose the projects within that target neighborhood. Um, we saw this as a real opportunity with Clark Fulton um, for as long as we had been built, working with the project. So we worked with the, uh, Councilwoman Jasmine Santana, um, Metro West Community Development Organization, other neighborhood stakeholders um, to lobby for the, the Clark Fulton neighborhood. And then our project was the first project that was uh, selected by the city of Cleveland to receive the Ohio Housing, housing, the Ohio housing Tax Credits um, for the housing portion of the project. In October of that year, we submitted our uh, application to the state of Ohio for historic tax credits. Um, and in December of 2019, we were awarded Ohio historic tax credits by the state, um, and then the federal historic tax credits in February of, or in February of 2020. Also in December of 2019, CMHA approved our application for 60 housing vouchers. So all 60 units of the project will be uh, affordable housing supported by their housing vouchers. A little bit about Morton Judy Levin, um, Morton his family. Judy is our is our uh, co-owner and vice president, um, and she handles a lot of the portfolio management of our of our assets once we've acquired them, once we've built them, once we place them into service, and we have tenant unit uh, we have tenants um, moving into the properties. She works with our, with our um, property managers, um, with our maintenance staffs, making sure that we are complying with local federal and state uh, regulations for um, residential housing and the compliance of, of our various tax credit programs and, and, and loan programs that we have to finance the, the, the properties. The development team on this project is really is a, is a team of local experts um, in, in doing these types of projects. Um, I've talked to you already about uh, Levin Group Metro West. They have 
in two years, in the last two years, they've sort of decoupled from the Detroit Shoreway Community Development Organization, um, and so they are now a standalone organization. And it's one of the reasons why we wanted to bring them on as partner with this project, because it was some capacity building for them, as well as experience doing this type of project, and they benefit, they will get a share of developer fee, develop a share of cash flow, um, so that they can get um, funding for programs that aren't co covered by their um, community development block grants. Wendy Naylor and Diana Wellman are our historic tax credit consultants on this project, not only helping us apply for the tax credits, um, but also the, um, the administration of the tax credit program and making sure that our design and construction methods are, are meeting of the National Park Service requirements. Uh, Ozan Construction, Dominic Ozan, uh, many of you might know, uh, Dominic and the Ozan family has been involved in Cleveland Construction now for over 60 years. Um, very prominent local builders who've been a lot, a lot of uh, public and, and uh, private development projects. And then Dimmit Architects, um, probably one of, the, one, one of the more well-known local architects in terms of their, their, their innovative design, but also doing projects on affordable housing properties, what they've done for us. They've done the new markets uh, or the market rate projects as well, and also these, these adaptive reuse historic rehab projects. I just described for you earlier the, the target investment area um, that OFA picked in the Clark Fulton neighborhood, as well as the project location along, uh, along Fulton Road. Here's some pictures of the current conditions and, uh, of, of, the, of the neighborhood. Um, on the upper left, we see Johnny's on, on Fulton. Um, in the middle, in the upper middle is on the Lynn Omni building, which is, shares a parking lot with our property. Um, and at one point, that, pro that building and our building were joined but about 100 years ago, someone decided to separate them. Um, so it's a separate parcel, it's a separate address, um, would eventually be eligible for historic tax credits later on, but then it does have a separate owner um, who bought the property about 20 years ago and, and has put a little bit of money into it. Um, the St. Rocco's in the lower left-hand corner, um, but the rest of the other three pictures are current pictures of the building. And you can tell it's, it's got huge windows, it's got a lot of, it's a, it's a large brick building with uh, wood, internal wood queen trusses to support the building, um, and it needs a, a lot of work. In this picture already, this is a, a, the rendering from Demon Architects on the building once it is finished. Here's another rendering from the corner of West 33rd Street and Paris Avenue. Here's the, the, the site plan of the building on the first floor. We'll get a little more detail there. Um, what's blacked out in the middle of the parking lot there, it, it doesn't show up well, but those are uh, semi-permeable pavers. Um, and that, so that our parking lot will um, help reduce water, you know, water runoff going into the sewer system. Here's the first floor layout of the building. Um, we did a fit plan. Initially, we had a single tenant uh, who was very interested in the building. We, we were in discussions with them for over a year and a half, but because of COVID and sort of their strategic planning process, they just had to sort of hold on to all of their current real estate um, and didn't want to um, enter into any new facilities. Um, but they were, they were our first tenant, and so this is how we divided up the, the, the space for them and we laid everything out for them. Um, but since we have been talking with um, two medical providers, um, fairly qualified health, health centers, as well as a local, highly reputable, long-time uh, provider of early childhood education um, services, both daycare and, and, and well, pre-K services. And so we're currently in, in the lease negotiations with that. Um, the blue area is the child care area. That's about 11,000 square feet. It gives um, the users uh, two outdoor areas, one here along Paris Avenue, which is a, a very lightly traveled road, but it would be fenced off here as well as on the back side right here on the parking lot in West 33rd Street. And they could get access from, from within the building. You can provide them access from classrooms directly outside, as well as a, a, a kitchen area for the prepare, for they could have prepared foods. Um, this area here is for the office of the property manager, as well as a community meeting room that would be used by both tenants, residential tenants, and could also be used by the commercial tenants as well. Here's the main entry off the, the, the parking lot. Residential tenants would turn here to go up into a, an elevator lobby and, and, and mail room. 
And there's little tenants and users would come through another set of doors here to access the other parts of the building. Um, this area here is for parent drop-off for the daycare. City of Cleveland in their design review required that we have a, an entrance here off of Paris Avenue. So in case people were walking up from, uh, from Clark, they could access the, the, the building. They wouldn't have to walk around the building, but they could access it off of, uh, off of Paris Avenue. This area here is uh, you know, office space area. And then the, the red and orange and yellow area is the medical area. We laid out um, exam rooms, behavioral health, um, as, as well as a, a, essentially you know, adding up addiction services as well, as well as a pharmacy. And then we have our, you know, this area here is the, this is electrical mechanical services to the building. And this would be, you know, your, your deliveries, but also trash area trash service out of the building. They lay out the, the first and second, the second and third floors uh, of, the, of the building do lay out identical to each other. Um, there are 12 one bedroom units that have rent of $829 a month. Two bedroom units, um, there's 42 of those at, at just over $1,000 a month and three bedroom units. There's 12 of those at, at, at $1,337 a month. Um, it, really was at the encouragement of Cleveland Community Development as well as uh, Councilwoman Santana of, of getting the CMHA vouchers for the, for the project. Um, to make this affordable in that neighborhood, it would have been rents of less than $500 a month, um, but that could not have possibly have supported the, the, the debt service for the project. Um, we, were, we have had multiple projects where we, we have Section 8 uh, contracts already directly with HUD. Um, it had been several years since we had a contract through CMHA. Um, so we went to go meet with CMHA, um, discuss the project with them. Um, we're very intrigued by the sort of the new leadership and new staff and new direction of, of CMHA and, and that they are much more sort of let's work with own property owners let's, to, to get good qualified tenants and, and, and get them the housing that they need and let's not be an obstacle um, to that, that, that match of, of tenants and, and units. Um, so we've been, you know, very impressed working with them um, and, and realized this was something that we absolutely wanted to, to participate in with them. So that we could get, you know, a, a, a market rent but may, and, and to be able to support the debt service on the project while making it affordable to the, um, to, to the to local tenants. Can you run through those numbers again? A, a tw there's 12 one-bedroom apartments? Yes. And how much did you say you're anticipating? $829 a month. Okay, and then the 42 two bedroom is $1,017 a month. Okay, and then what is left? These are eight. These are three 12 unit. There's, there's three bedroom units, and those are, there's, there's 12 of those. 12 of those. Yes, at $1,337 a month. And these are CMHA's um, rent calculations based on the, the recent um, guidance from HUD. So those are the amounts that someone who was interested in living there would pay the say two bedroom is one thousand one hundred and seventy dollars is what happened to the percentage of their income they that's the that's the total amount that we would receive the tenant would pay no more than thirty percent of their income I see I mean that'd be based on you know thirty to sixty percent of area median income okay so they have to they'd have to qualify their their income um, bring bring their documents and we would work with CMHA would do the pre-qualification and then we would they then send them pass them off to us. We would do our qualification based on on their incomes and, and qualify them for the unit. It doesn't, I could be wrong, but a two bedroom apartment for 1170 doesn't seem like a low income apartment. That's. But then the voucher pays the difference. I understand. So that's the maximum that we, that we okay. would get. If, if I might, Madam yes. Chair, what happens is that these are project based vouchers. They're dedicated to this project. Yes. You come in, if you qualify to rent, from them, then they send the person to CMHA. CMHA approves them. What happens is a percentage of your income will be paid. So if this is a, a three-bedroom unit of 1337 and you qualify under the 30%, you may only pay $150 a month. They will subsidize the and they pay the And CMHA pays the balance. And so this is a real deal mm -hmm. for affordable housing in this marketplace. Yes. Um, however, this is uh, people ca are typically not going to pay 1300 In fact, um, it is rare for someone to pay the full 1300 Since this is a project-based property, they will not be 
in there to do that. You're going to look, there's a waiting list for the vouchers in this county because we're short over 40,000 units of affordable housing. Well, you're assured that these units will be leased because you have people that are looking for units for that price and qualify for, for the subsidy. That's correct, yes. Got it. If I can follow up with a question somewhat related to that, the commercial piece, mm -hmm. I know you're in negotiations there, but as with the negotiations with the first group of people you were looking at, mm -hmm. thought it was going to happen and didn't, uh, what is sure, if that were to fall through, where, where does that put you in this project? I mean, that's, a, that's half of the amount of square footage that you are required. Talk 64,000, that's 30. And that, that and I, I think, you know, that was also a, a Tony misspoke. The, the building itself is 112,000 square feet. 112. 31,400 square feet is the first floor. So okay. it's, a, it's roughly, it's a, it's, it's a third of the building. The third of the building. Yes. Okay. So a third of the building. Um, I mean, I guess maybe that would be a question for our directors is, is that, do we need to have that lease in place and signed before this project goes through? No. So what if that were to fall through and now we're looking for tenants? Does that matter? Yeah. <laughs> if, if I, if I can, so the way, and, and as Tony said, the, the building, because of the tax credits, the building is, is, is a condo. There's two condos. There's a commercial condo and there's a residential condo. It functions as one building and one property, but for the tax credit investors, they look at two separate books. Yeah. The loan from the Cuyahoga County is assigned to our residential okay. condo. All right. So the, the, the income from the, the residential portion is what's going to pay the county loan back. Okay. So, you know, so from a, a debt service standpoint, and I think even, you know, it, Tony and, and, and it, you, everyone looks at, you know, they, they, as Tony mentioned, they, they, they factor in vacancy into those numbers. Typically, they factor in about 7% vacancy, um, which is a, a, you know, a, a, a good number to use. But affordable housing, typically, historically, your vacancy is less than 3%. Because, as, as, as Councilwoman Stevens suggested, there's wait lists. And so if somebody moves out, you turn the unit. I mean, we have about 10 days to, to turn the unit before we start losing money on it. And then someone's ready to, 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 to come in and fill the unit. Um, and so that's your, and that's where you see that, that, that time between someone moving out and someone moving in is what creates that vacancy. So there's a pretty consistent... A turn Turnover and, and released... Percentage correct. Okay. The, and I will say yeah, on our end, on, on the advantage to a developer like ourselves to, to do affordable housing, um, it doesn't have the upside income potential as market rate. But you, if you can get your turn units, if you can turn them quickly and you have good, effective, efficient management and staff, you don't have much vacancy loss. Okay. And if I may ask also the state and federal historic tax credit, doesn't that come with some strings attached as far as what you can remodel or how you can change the building? Or, I mean, do you have to keep the name of the building? Are there any issues there that... Uh... Name-wise, no, but yes, there are. The National Park Service has standards, and that's why we have our consultants who are guiding us through this is to... You know, what we can do, I mean, we, we went through a three and a half month process with the state of Ohio and the Park Service of just getting our windows approved. Right. Um, you right. have to preserve the look of the building. Right. And again, what goes, there are these huge wood trusses in, in the building. I can't fake that. Uh, that need, when I replace that, that has to be wood. And wood is really expensive right now. Um, so yeah, there is, you know, the, the, when we pull out wood flooring that's warped, I mean, we have to put back, you know, the, the wood that's of the same width that we took out. Well, um, even though it's been dormant for a number of years and have had businesses in and out of there, yes. still the restrictions, if you're going to accept their money. The you know, color of the mortar, you know, has to match, right. you know, with the bricks. Yes. And, and the way the, the park service states it is, 
it's our money to preserve historic buildings. If you want our money, this is what you're going to do. Me too. Yes. Okay, and that, and still under those parameters, I don't have it here. How much they're giving, or loaning, or supporting, is it's worth the. Oh yes, absolutely. Okay. Any questions up to this point? Yes, Council Councilwoman Stevens. So um, I see that you have three million something in funds from OFA. Are those multi? Is that part of the multifamily loan program? It is the the four point three million dollar senior mortgage. Yes, is is their multifamily loan program? And then. Um, you answered one of my questions uh, in the uh, their project-based vouchers. Ownership, what percentage of ownership does Clark Metro have? So they, they will have 25% oh, of, the, of the general partnership. They'll get, they'll go, they will get 25% of developer fee. They'll get 25% of surplus cash. Um, you talked about how you condominiumize the commercial for the versus the residential. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't um, get tenants, how will you service the new market tax credit debt? So as of right now, it's this project. I'll start with this. The way that we've structured the ownership of it with with Metro West, um, the way that the, the services that we've been targeting. Um, the way the, and, and, and the impact of what this project is, is, you know, can do for the neighborhood. There is a lot of local and national organizations that get new market tax credit allocations that are very interested in, in this project. Um, I said, and some of them for a variety of reasons. Some of it's because we're proud of the daycare. Some of it's because it's a historic rehab. Some of it's because it's, we have the, you know, fully qualified health center on the, on the first floor. Um, there, there's one group locally that has new market tax credits that wants to see the project move forward, and they are, they would consider putting their new market tax credits in if we did not have tenants sign leases. They're considering it. Everybody else is going to require that we have leases signed before they put their new market tax credits in, and then we get the leverage loan. Um, and and that is, it's a little bit of an advantage of doing of having a condo structure like this is we can actually start the residential piece before we start the commercial piece if there's a lag behind with the getting the the, the tenants uh, the commercial because tenants this lease. is an existing structure so you can do the new markets improvements after you finish correct and we and because we also have the historic pieces we can because I've had deals where they wouldn't let you close the low income housing tax credits without the new market tax credits being closed. Correct. And because of the, but with the historic tax credits in place, we can, we can do the core and shell of the building and get the historic tax credits okay. to pay for that. We can white box the first floor as we wait for the, uh, the, the leases of the- Who are you looking at syndicating this for you? PNC Bank. They're, they're going to buy the credits as well as syndicate the them, yes, they, Ohio they are, Cap sometimes acts as the syndicator. Ohio Cap, we have a long relationship with Ohio Cap from the time that they started. Um, they have been very good partners with us. They're currently a partner with us on a project that we are com about four weeks from completing over in Huff. Mm -hmm. um, it's a renovation of 102 townhomes, affordable housing townhomes. Um, they've been, a f in the spite of COVID and all the delays that we've had, they've been fantastic partners of ours. Um, we took this to them and they said, this is awesome. This is wonderful. We're not large enough to support this. Okay. So who are you, are you using Royal or, um, RBC or one of those others or we, we had PNC is doing both. PNC is doing both. We've, okay. we had discussions with uh, RBC on this. Um, and, uh, and, um, PNC is doing it both. Citizens is going to do the construction lending okay. on it. Um, locally on the commercial side, and this is where it just gets, we really start parsing things down. Um, on, the, on the commercial side of the condo, the, his, the federal historic credits, mm -hmm. GBX is going to be the syndicator of okay. those. They can provide some better pricing than PNC Bank can, um, but PNC needed... For the pricing they're giving us on the housing tax credits, they needed the historics to balance out their investments. So they are so they needed the other pieces of it to work 
for them. So are they going to buy both your state and your federal tax credit? On the residential, and then they're going to buy the state on the commercial. And then, and then GBX, GBX will do the federal okay. on, the, on the commercial. And you're going to close all of this when? Well, <laughs> the goal that we that we we have been in our yeah the goal the goal because we all know that they, these never do it. Exactly yeah, I know. Um, if you if Mort Levin were standing here, he said he, he would have told you we should have closed a month ago. Um, <laughs> everything should have been happened a month ago. Uh, but we are actually we, we we have advanced some of the work that we're doing at risk right now. Um, so we take advantage of some good weather. We've done a lot of structural stabilization in the book in the, in the building of the last year. Um, starting about a year ago, we had our structural engineer go through and identify any areas that were problematic um, where we thought we might lose the building if we went through another freeze thaw cycle. Um, so in January, we started that work. Um, it's continuing today. We're trying to get it weather, the building pretty much weather tight before, as we hit winter here. Um, so we can, once closed, we can go into the building work without having to put in winter conditions, um, which is just dead cost to the project. So we are um, having talk, you know, our, our conversations with the city of Cleveland, with um, PNC Bank. We're doing our due diligence weekly phone calls for, for creating the organizations and the structures. The accountants and attorneys are hard at work doing creating those entities. Um, I think all of the documentation we're going to have need to close will be ready by on the residential piece by the end of the month. Okay. Um, we have survey work that needs to get done. Um, the survey work, it, there, everyone's backed up. That's pushed out probably about 45 days. So realistically, um, probably right after Thanksgiving on the residential. Uh, the commercial, um, because of the timing of the, the new market tax credits, um, would probably be right after the first of the year. So you'll be done in 18 months? So right now, per OFA, we have to deliver the residential units um, by December 31st of 2022. Oh, my goodness. That's also why we've advanced some of the work. So that now OFA has been, as we all know, there has been um, some increases in, in construction costs. So OFA did you is apply it, for an additional million? We've applied for additional credits, and, and they, they could potentially give a, restart the, 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 the clock on, on our deliverables. So you've got a carryover allocation that exactly. changed. Okay, and, but, but what didn't change with that carryover? So he, the reason I'm asking is when can we drive by and expect this will be complete? I would because expect giving, this in, in We're the, going to be giving you some type of deferral. I would expect in uh, first quarter of 2023. Okay. And you mentioned, and I, I will point this out, the, the reason why we asked for a little bit of an extension with the, 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 the county loan is the Ohio Housing Finance Agents, their multifamily loan program requires that we refinance in 17 years. And since the commercial, since the county loan is tied into the residential condo, we wanted to be able to refinance that debt without a sort of a, a proverbial gun to our head of, of the clock ticking with um, the county so that we can refinance that, get a, get a traditional FHA or Fannie Freddie backed mortgage in at that time and be able to pay the county off as well. So we just wanted those to match up. I don't have any further questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Very interesting. Thank you. Any other questions we have? I have one just facility question. The mm -hmm. um, parking lot that was built for the Northern Ohio Blanket Mill. Mm -hmm. So now we're turning this into a completely different vision. Is the parking lot adequate for not only the daycare, I think you said it's going in, healthcare, um, then you have all the tenants that are gonna need spaces to park. Uh, how does that parking lot look? So per, per existing city code, we are short about three parking spaces for the uses and the tenants. Now I can tell you, um, per city code, we require it requires one parking space for every for every residential unit. But affordable housing, I can I can tell you, not every tenant has a car. It's probably about two thirds of the tenants. Um, the daycare, while they does have full time employees, a lot of it is drop off. You know, they use 
space for 10 minutes where they drop a child off or pick a child up and then, and then they leave. Um, we are, the city has just adopted a new master plan for the neighborhood and we are working with the city planning department on uh, infrastructure improvements that we want to see around that block. And they are amenable to adding street parking, both along Paris Avenue and, and West 33rd Street to, to, to functionally get the parking that we need. The, um, so you don't find any tenants in the two thirds that would have a vehicle have two vehicles? It's not typically what you find in these apartments? It is, it is that would be atypical. Highly unusual. Yes. Typically what, what in, in a situation like that is it's a tenant who is allowing a, a family member or friend to temporarily keep a car on site and that is against our house rules. And so we have conversations with tenants that that, that violates their lease and you know, we, we deal with that. The city of Cleveland also, I mean, they think there's too much parking. You know, we, we want multimodal and this is multimodal. Um, and, and while we certainly appreciate, you know, and, and, and get that type of aspects of, of scale and sizing for what you have around them, um, as a developer, it is, it's, you're, you're telling me I, I, you want these tenants, but you want me to have less parking. You know, that's sometimes gets, we, we, we respect it, we understand it, but we also push back to try to get as much Outside as of the uh, drop off and pick up of children, what were the other two commercial spaces that were there? One was, was it a health center? The other tenant that we are talking to is, is it would be a fairly qualified health center. And how is that impacted on the parking given you're pretty tight with your residential parking? There is part, the, we have 107 spaces total, I think by, by code for, for the, the uses that we have planned out for code. I think we actually need 110. So we're like three P like three. And that's not including any, any um, street parking. That's an issue that you need to overcome and deal with. I just was curious mm -hmm. to know what you had. All right, are there any other questions? Okay, so hearing none, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting and look forward to 2024. Is that what you said? 2023. 23. Yes. So only a few years away. Oh, yes. Right <laughs> on the corner. Thank you very much. All right, so do I have a motion to approve the 2021 0223 plan that is before us to send to full council? So moved. Second, Stevens. Thank you. First and second's been approved and seconded. Do I have um, a motion to approve? I'm sorry, do I have a motion to vote on the approval of this plan? Roll call. Uh, Roll call, yes. Uh, all, all in favor, all it's favor. getting late. I've been Aye. here since this morning. Aye. 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 Hearing any nays? Hearing no nays, this is now approved. Thank, Thank you, you very much, I appreciate it. Uh, all right, any other miscellaneous business? Hearing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Second, Second to adjourn, thank you. We are adjourned, thank you everyone. <laughs>